director, Radio Free Europe Research. Mr. Murphy. Thank you most kindly, Mr. President and Mrs. Dipsko, the Honorable Mrs. Wilkinson and Kielewski, members of Parliament, members of the Presidium, delegates to the European Freedom Council and the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc of Nations, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to be here and to express my gratitude for your warm hospitality. Let me convey the greetings of a number of people known to you from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Incorporated in Munich. Ambassador Frank Shakespeare in Portugal asked me to convey his warm greetings to this meeting, as did Senator <laughs> as did Senator James Buckley. very much wished to be giving this address this evening, but who is in the process of moving back to the United States where he is going to be a judge in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. And finally, George Bailey, the former director of Radio Liberty and someone known to you, a favorite son, Mr. George Irving, the director of Radio Free Europe all send their very warmest regards. This evening I'd like to say a few words about the structure of Soviet disinformation and psychological warfare. A few words about the connection between what you are calling at this conference the low and the high frontiers, and finally give you some insight into how we try and respond to our target audiences, the 21 services to whom we broadcast uh, behind the Iron Curtain, in explaining and making the case to the captive nations on behalf of President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative. Western Europe, I hardly need to say, continues to be the major target for Soviet disinformation efforts and psychological warfare. In recent years, these efforts have been aimed at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and more recently still at President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative. Until the 1950s, the term desinformatia was used in the Soviet Union to refer to activities which they now call active measures. The term active measures itself is a literal translation from the Russian Aktivnia Meripriatsia. That's the name which is officially given to Service A, the organization in the KGB's first chief directorate, the Soviet overseas intelligence arm, which is responsible for the covert element of active measures. As the Soviets use this concept, active measures covers a broad range of covert activities and deceptive practices, including spreading false or misleading information, media manipulation, the use of local communist parties, communist front groups, agents of influence, and other <coughs> operations aimed at promoting Soviet foreign policy goals while undercutting those of Moscow's opponents, chiefly the United States. 
Perhaps the most important characteristic of the Soviet active measures program is its very high degree of centralization and integration. There are three basic organizations responsible. Each of these organizations pursues its own programs, but these programs are carefully orchestrated and integrated into an overall campaign. The Soviet Communist Party's International Information Department, which was established in 1978 under the directorship of Leonid Zamyatin, largely as a response to the quickness with which the United States in the arms control talks throughout the 1970s was able to respond to public uh, and press questioning about the progress in the talks. This International Information Department is responsible for developing and overseeing the implementation of Soviet media campaigns. This department plays a decisive role in deciding what aspects of Soviet policy to discuss openly and how to present those aspects to various international publics. I happen to see the first evening here in London, the BBC did a very excellent reportage on Soviet television today. And this is Vladimir Posner, who speaks flawless American English, was a guest on this program. And he had an answer for everything, except for the question posed by one of the journalists as to whether the Soviet public was informed about the nature and the extent of the Soviet program <coughs> in strategic defense. And of course, he professed complete ignorance uh, about any such program and denied that there was one in the Soviet Union, as they regularly do. But in doing so, Mr. Posner was taking his directives from guidances which are prepared by this International Information Department and which are circulated on a regular basis to all Soviet media personalities, press, radio, television, and public speakers as well. The principal task of this International Information Department is to present Soviet views to a variety of international publics and to counter the free flow of information generated by Western media. Soviet officials frequently travel, frequently write, excuse me, for the international press, travel to the West, offer propaganda lectures as well as interviews, and address meetings of international communist front organizations. A second organ of the Communist Party, the International Department of the Central Committee, under its chief, Boris Ponomaryov, coordinates the activities of the various front groups and bilateral friendship societies, as well as the role of non-ruling foreign <laughs> communist parties and foreign revolutionary groups. Finally, the third organization which plays a critical role in Soviet active measures is Service A of the KGB, which provides covert support to Soviet disinformation efforts. And that support takes the form of covert, that is to say falsely attributed propaganda, including oral and written disinformation, forgeries, and agent of influence operations. i give you now an example of how we try to speak to them on this particular theme of the Strategic Defense Initiative. And this is raw material for a script that was used only a few weeks ago and broadcast on all 21 of the RFE RL language services. 
It began with a brief statement of a major Soviet propaganda theme, which the audiences in our target areas have heard more than once. Soviet propaganda says that the United States' restless search for military superiority over the USSR, its massive buildup of conventional and strategic arms, and its plans to extend the arms race to the heavens, is bringing the world ever closer to the abyss of nuclear disaster. Plans for Star Wars, according to Soviet propaganda, are in particular designed to make it possible for the United States to deliver a first disarming strike on the USSR with impunity. Sound familiar to you, I'm sure. Our response to this, to the people behind the Iron Curtain, runs as follows. The Soviet nuclear war catastrophe propaganda theme is designed to legitimize the USSR domestically and internationally as the sole bulwark of world peace in the nuclear age and to exacerbate nuclear anxiety in the West. Earlier Soviet attempts to legitimize the regime which emerged in October 1917, first by portraying it as the spark and model of a world revolution and then as a model of productiveness and economic growth, have exhausted their utility. This third attempt to establish legitimacy and to justify the inordinately huge sums of money spent by the USSR on armaments by presenting Soviet military power as the only force standing in the way of a nuclear conflagration unleashed by world imperialism is both cynical and dangerous. It is cynical because Soviet leaders themselves, no less than their Western counterparts, do not believe that the world is on the brink of nuclear war. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Soviet leaders, for all their bluster and cries of alarm, actually perceive a direct threat to the Soviet Union. I have been when I worked for the United States government as a participant in some talks with high Soviet officials. And in those private talks, they dismissed very quickly the question. <coughs> but not for propaganda. Their propaganda reflects tactical foreign policy objectives rather than genuine security concerns. In fact, I might tell you that uh, the only person who strenuously and deeply believed and proselytized in the Soviet Union that the American military rearmament <coughs> program under President Reagan was directly designed for purposes of direct attack upon Soviet territory was Marshal. Nikolai Vasilyevich Ogarko. And although, of course, it has not been publicized in the Soviet Union, that was one of the major reasons for his removal. And the Soviet nuclear war catastrophe propaganda is dangerous because it gives the USSR a permanent stake in inciting and maintaining a consistently high level of nuclear anxiety in the world, the ultimate consequences of which no one can foresee. At a minimum, the stridency of Soviet war rhetoric required by this scare tactic cannot but serve as a major improvement impediment to relations with the West and cooperation in those limited areas where cooperation is both desirable and possible. And the campaigns get in each other's way, why they're cynical and dangerous.
and above all, to give in programs like that to people behind the Iron Curtain. Some understanding of why their state in the Strategic Defense Initiative Program is no less great than the state that we in the West have in that program. Because in a moment of crisis, such as I described earlier, faced with those awesome time constraints and pressures dictated by the sheer compressed period in which faithful decisions have to be made. It is eminently in the interests of people behind the Iron Curtain that Western political leaders have a wider variety of a wider variety of more humane options than the option of a massively vengeful strike against innocent people. It's difficult to assess the overall impact of Soviet active measures in the West, for so they really aim at and involve a long-term process of erosion. Western Europe, in particular, poses some very specific problems for Soviet activities. Western Europeans form one of the world's most sophisticated and literate audiences and include some of the finest professional journalists and media. They are not easily fooled by the often clumsy attempts that are the hallmarks of active measures elsewhere. Most Western Europeans are also able to see through blatant communist use of front groups, which appear, at least in my view, to have had only limited influence on governmental policy and public opinion in Western Europe. The of the United States, as you know, is faced with an astounding fiscal deficit, and there have been very few programs reviewed by the Appropriations Committee in the United States Congress in the last year and a half, which have not been cut in some way or another. Notwithstanding that fact, as a measure of the seriousness of the United States government and Congress about communications to the people behind the Iron Curtain. They have supported a $70 million modernization program for radio transmitters to ensure that the kilowatt power of the radio signal, which we are trying to put into our target countries in the face of Soviet damage, will be sufficiently strong in most instances to overcome that jam. As to the question of satellite television broadcasts, that is theoretically possible and practically possible now. Television programs could very easily be beamed from satellite anywhere on the surface of the globe. As you know, the Soviets have already tried to stake out a position on this matter, and former Foreign Secretary Andrei Andreevich Rubinko at the United Nations <coughs> hinted that, or said flat out, that attempts to place television programs from satellite into the area of the USSR would be considered hostile interference in the internal affairs of their country, and he hinted at possible direct action being taken against such satellites and such attempts. But 
This is something which is theoretically possible now. There are people who are very interested and who are working on this. And I would not be surprised if someday in our lifetime, the West will challenge the Soviet Union, not just in the EPA, as we have here before, but we will challenge them in a more direct and in a more immediate way through the powerful medium of time. But that is something which exists in the future. Influence around the world. Communism is clearly not a movement which has a tied <coughs> history behind it. The EFC supports the Reagan doctrine that denies the thesis that once a country falls under communist domination, it must remain communist. And it confirms the belief that the United States and the Western world should support anti-communist national movements for national independence and basic democratic principles. It must be the right of citizens in countries subjugated by Soviet Russia to seek their freedom by all appropriate means, by arms, if everything else fails, in order to try to replace a communist totalitarian state with one that is democratic and re-establish their independent national states by a process of self-determination. This is especially valid for peoples oppressed within the borders of the Soviet Russian Empire, the Ukrainians, Belarusians, Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Estonians, <laughs> Latvians, Lithuanians, Turkestanis, and others, and of peoples in the so-called satellite states, subjugated by Russian military might, the Poles, Czechs, Slovakians, Hungarians, Bulgarians, Romanians, and others. Soviet Russian ideologist Mahir Susnov once stated that the transition to a communist system of rule is irreversible. The West has too long accepted this concept tacitly. The recovery for freedom and democracy of the island of Grenada has provided the proof that Moscow is not willing to fight for its puppet states when they are too far from the center of the Russian Empire. The EFC's main concern is the support of the struggle for freedom and independence of the subjugated peoples suppressed by Soviet Russian rule in the Euro-Asian geographical area. The Chronicle of the Underground Catholic Church in Ukraine the Chronicle of the Catholic Church in Lithuania, and the struggle of the Polish people are proof of the ongoing fight for freedom. In Ukraine, the freedom fighters stress the issue of national and human rights. Their organizations have been crushed, but always regenerate themselves. Soviet Russian mass media constantly attack the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, thereby demonstrating the vitality of its national, Christian, social, and democratic ideas. However, the religious and patriotic centers around the Ukrainian Catholic Church need support from the West. In Poland, underground leaders have called for a long march of resistance to the regime, building clandestine organizations in schools and factories scientific, academic, and cultural institutions. The EFC supports this long march. Workers continue to strike in Ukraine. An independent trade union was organized in Ukraine years before Solidarity was established in Poland, but it was crushed by the KGB. Western technology in the field of communications has developed with impressive speed. The EFC supports increased radio broadcasts and, in the future, television broadcasts to all parts of the Russian Empire through the use of satellites, which, if jammed, would be capable of countermeasures. 
It is vitally important not to impose foreign content on radio broadcasting, but to strengthen and reinforce the original culture and inherent values of every nation, opposing the Bolshevist philosophy and way of life, which are, of course, imposed through Marxist-Leninist oppression and ter terror on the subjugated nations. The revolutionary liberation processes in the Russian Communist Empire encompass all strata of life, opposing the enemy with their own national structures, as underground churches, through the struggle for private ownership, national traditions, heroes and geniuses, and wide varieties of national cultures against the Bolshevist anti-culture. A spiritual revolution is a precondition of the entire political revolutionary process. It is necessary to keep in mind that no political revolution can succeed without an ideology, one for which people are willing to live, fight, and if necessary, to die. The ideology of liberation and the science of the overthrow of tyranny, political warfare, and revolt are all necessary against the secular religion of evil. Already, armed resistance to Marxist regimes has proved possible and is growing in countries that fell under Russian domination between 1975 and 1980. For example, South Vietnam, which fell in 75, uh, Laos, 75, Angola, 75 to 76, Mozambique, 75 to 76, Ethiopia, 77 to 78, South Yemen, 77 to 78, Cambodia, 79, Grenada, 79, Nicaragua, 79, 80, <coughs> Afghanistan, 1979, and Suriname, 1980. In all of these countries, armed liberation struggles are going on, except in South Yemen. Grenada was liberated by US Caribbean troops in 1983. The EFC <coughs> encourages support in international fora for all the freedom fighters of the nations subjugated by Bolshevism. The reception of freedom fighter leaders by political leaders of Western governments and other forms of assistance. The guarantor of the ongoing liberation struggle against communism on almost all continents is a strong Western defense. The EFC supports the Strategic Defense <coughs> Initiative which is strengthening the technical basis of Western defense capability. The present concept of mutual assured destruction is by itself an insufficient deterrent strategy for the peoples of the West and the subjugated peoples. SDI may be the first step towards effective arms control and mutual, balanced, and verifiable disarmament. SDI combined with support of the liberation struggle against Soviet Russian imperialism are the best hope of avoiding thermonuclear war. The EFC supports the determination of President Ronald Reagan to go forward with the research into space-based strategic defense systems. The West should make clear that the time has come for the NATO alliance to rely on a mix of defensive and offensive nuclear weapon systems. Strategic anti-missile defense systems are a unique type of defense which is directed exclusively at the dis destruction of the enemy's aggressive nuclear, weapon, nuclear weapons and not at human beings. This is a potential revolution in the traditional concepts of nuclear deterrence and national security. The EFC also supports President Ronald Reagan's demand of the United Nations for the withdrawal of Soviet Russian and surrogate communist forces from Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Nicaragua. These communist troops are there to bolster up totalitarian regimes, which are not wanted by the peoples of these countries. And uh, the regimes of these countries are dependent on Soviet support for their existence. 
The EFC demands the withdrawal of Soviet Russian armies of occupation from all the subjugated countries in the USSR and from the so-called satellite countries so that these nations could re-establish their true identity and democracy by a process of free and fair elections. Western Europe is unequivocally confronted by the necessity to expand its own technological, economic, and military potential, in particular its conventional weaponry, in order to redress the military imbalance between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. From a geostrategic point of view, the maintenance of the military potential of Spain within NATO is of special importance. The security of the Mediterranean, as well as of the North African littoral, merit special attention and are a particular interest to Italy and to Spain. Political stability and economic progress on the part of these two Mediterranean countries are absolutely necessary. The United Kingdom is an important factor for peace and security, not only in the European context, owing to its considerable political experience, especially in international affairs, but also because of its highly advanced technology and independent nuclear deterrent. France, with its own force de frappe, foreign policy, critical of the USSR, and alliance with the United States of America within NATO, is a nuclear co-guarantor for not enabling Moscow to split the Western community of free nations. The German Federal Republic, with its economic potential and strong armed forces in the front line of NATO, plays a key role on the European continent. For West Germany, the objective of national reunification in freedom by peaceful democratic means must be an essential national goal. The Benelux countries, by the fulfillment of their military obligations to NATO defense policy, have strengthened the cohesion of Western European defense. You know, my sisters, my brothers, we are a part of Turks. One of is we are a part of Oriental people and Muslim people. We don't love the, we don't like go to paradise if in paradise no war. Because we like freedom. So this is our fighting is also for us a religion obligation and religion duty. You know, Nine, it was 1916, was a mass revolt in Turkestan. Mr. Krenitsky said it was for Russia second front. From 1918, from February till May 1919, for, for was the big one, revolution moment, this called, Soviets called, Baspachi, rubber moment, but it was a national revolution gone 16 years. It is too difficult, all problems of such countries, more nine, more four million square kilometers is the large, big country, and more, nearly 40 million people problem to speak, to explain here. I will say for you all friends who had in his speech and discussions in papers, messages, etc., using the word Turkestan, because Soviets are trying for us to make no Turkestanian but Central Asians, so it had a, in, this, uh, in this case had a, a progress, 1924, uh, 1924 was published in the war Turkestan. After this delay, almost 180 minutes, I was the Air Force officer, now I am a combatant. So I respected the time and law 
given to me by the chair of the board. So I have nothing to say much about the form of the system, because that is too long. But I would like to read to you and save the time for my colleagues, because we have a very important topic to say. Before I turn to my, co my colleagues, I want to read to all of you and my dear young freedom fighters, two famous war from the communist dictators and the aggressor. First is Kapmaus. Once he wrote, I quote, the communists disdain to conceal their view and aims. They openly declare that their aims and can be achieved only by forcible overthrow all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communist resolution and revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chain. They have a work to win. That's the first. The second one, a century later, a devil, Nikita Kuchev, declared that, I quote, we, the communists, must realize that we cannot exist, coexist eternally for the long time. One of us must go to the grave. The capitalists do not want to go to their grave either. So, what can be done? We must push them to their grave. Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, the famous experienced and expert fighting against communists. I'm a young generation. I would like to guarantee with you, as Mr. Habib Mayar has mentioned to you recently, this is the time for us to destroy their ideology. We will win if we unite. We unite with the action more than talk. I hope God will in our side. The liberation of all world anti-communists will be win in the near future. Thank you. Now, now, I have a very special request. We ask only three and a half minutes by the law of the chair. I will introduce you, Mr. Nguyen Kim Khan, who will announce what they did for us now. The capital of Thai, Vietnam. À l'occasion de votre présence d'aujourd'hui, vous êtes les membres parlementaires, professeurs et docteurs, étudiants et anciens militaires à toute race, etc., symbolisant la classe intellectuelle et élite dans la société. Today, on this occasion, with the presence of the members parliament in the United Kingdom, deputies, professors, doctors, students, and military personnel of all grades, as a symbol of the educated people in this society. Je voudrais vous faire remarquer notre sort. I would like to make a remark for our destiny. Honorable Sir Frederick M. Penning, vous apprécez un discours comme la nation de Russie communiste en Varissa à Vatican. Recently, Honorable Sir Frederick M. Bennett, in his speech on the condemnation of the communist Russians invading Afghanistan. Je vous prie, madame, monsieur, de réfléchir, de penser aussi le destin du sud Vietnam. I would like to ask you to think about a little bit on the destiny of the South Vietnam. Malgré le traité de la paix à Paris au début de l'année 1952, les communistes du Nord l'ont déchiré et trahi. And luckily, the Paris Treaty signed on late January 1972 was violated and tore apart by the North Vietnamese Communists and old co-senator, and the treaty was kept silent under the invasion of the Communist forces. In Spanish origin, they are English and European origin. They do not have Spanish names, but they have English names, they have German names, they wear American and European type of clothing. Their culture is European and English. Their religion is Protestant, predominantly Moravian. Now that doesn't sound too Indian, but let me tell you, we are very, very much Indian. Our people have fought the communists, and we have died 
for our freedom. This is the first time in the history that Mosquito Indians have taken up and actually fought to death for what they believed in. Under General Somoza, we were very passive people. And General Somoza allowed us to be on our own with every freedom that you can imagine. But then the Sandinista came in and said, we are not going to give you any freedom because you do not deserve it. You do not really care for the Sandinista. And that was the biggest mistake that the Sandinista has ever made. They told the Mosquito Indians that they were nothing. Our young men have gone out and fought with rifles that have actually fell apart in their hands during battle. We have gone out and fought for days in the jungle with no food except some jelly beans that we were able to get from children selling them in the street. We had no medicine and our fighters have their feet who are, that are actually rottening off from what we call jungle leprosy. But we keep on fighting because we who are Mosquito Indians are going to be free someday. I could tell you all about the atrocities that have happened, but I would only be repeating what every one of you know by heart. Dropping of children and women out of helicopters, packing helicopters with 80 to 90 children and then letting a helicopter crash. Taking mothers who were pregnant and ripping their stomachs open and pulling out the unborn children, putting old people in their church and in setting the church on fire, going into the villages and say, we love you, but we're going to have to burn your schools, your hospitals, your, your, your houses down, and we're going to have to kill your pigs, and we're going to have to force march you 200 miles through the jungle and the mountains so that the Contras cannot get to you and kill you. And you know what? At the end, concentration camps. So I could go on and on and tell you about that. But I want to tell you quickly about my wife, who happens to be a young person of only 41 years of age. Someone came here and said, we are getting old. What will the young people do when we go? Of the Soviet Union, which were drawn by the Hitler and Stalin himself two years earlier. The importance of this momentous event is still held on both sides of divided Europe. Continues with many letters never reaching their destination. All forms of material support for the West have been stopped and personal contacts with visitors from the West are regarded as treasonable offenses. It is not difficult to discern the reason for this renewed repression. Its aim is to spread fear, to isolate and paralyze the will of the enslaved people and to create a sense of hopelessness leading finally to submission. The repression is complemented by a venomous campaign of propaganda on the radio, on television, in the press, and in other publications aimed at discrediting the Ukrainian liberation movement, its history, and its past and present leaders both in Ukraine and in exile. Singled out for special attention have been His Holiness, the Patriarch of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, 
the late Cardinal Yosef Slipe, and our Prime Minister and President of the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc of Nations, the Honorable Yaroslav Stitsko. The lies and falsehoods emanating from the Russian leadership have known no bounds. Nothing has been spared in order to ridicule and compromise the Ukrainian national leaders. They believe that this will succeed in devaluing the Ukrainian national aspirations and deprive the national leaders of their support and following at home and of their allies abroad. However, despite this, the spirit and the will of the enslaved Ukrainian people remain steadfast, just as it always has in the face of such odds. Indeed, the resolve to continue the struggle for self-preservation and national freedom is stronger now than ever before. We have witnessed the emergence of new forms of active and passive resistance. No sooner have the ruthless state machine and KGB sought to plug one hole, then a new channel for national expressions opens up. Uh, to present the resolutions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the time. You've all been very patient. I implore you, this is the heart of the conference. It will not take long. It will take about 11 minutes. Thank you. Last night, the resolution committee met, and we're presenting to you these resolutions for your consideration and hopefully approval. ABN Conference Resolutions, London, November 21 through 24, 1985. Whereas the national liberation processes inside the Soviet Russian Empire are growing in strength and undermining the empire and its communist system, and whereas the Bolshevik tyrants confirm this in their emphasis on the necessary struggle against the so-called bourgeois nationalism and against religion, and whereas the chronicle of the underground Ukrainian Catholic Church in Ukraine and the underground chronicle of the Catholic Church in Lithuania, the armed struggle of the Afghan Mujahideen and the struggle of the Polish people testify to this fact with regard to all other nations. Whereas the young generation raises the standard in the struggle for defense of national dignity and traditions, the cult of national heroes, religion, religious values, inherent national ideals, institutions and cultural treasures, and courageously combat an imposed communist way of life based on total terror. Overall global strategy, including psycho strategy, should be developed by the free world against the global attack of Russian imperialism and communism, which seeks to conquer the entire world. The freedom fighter movement should be backed on the international forums, receive modern technological and electronic equipment from the Western powers for political psychological offensive and even military aid, according to the UN resolution of Namibia. The freedom fighter leaders should be publicly received by leaders of the free governments, and the national liberation formation should be recognized as legal representatives of the subjugated nations against their oppressors. The media should provide frequent coverage of the anti-communist national liberation movements and insurgencies. International news broadcasts being to the Soviet Union and its satellites should place special emphasis upon national liberation insurgencies against Russian and communist dominations, e.g. the Ukrainian insurgent army, the Lithuanian liberation army, the Turkestani Bashmachi, the Polish home army, Armia Krajowa, the Belarusian freedom fighters, the Afghan Mujahideen, the freedom fighters of Angola, Nicaragua, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and many others of the past and present time. The freedom fighters should be assisted in establishing information centers in major cities abroad. Films and books on the anti-communist national liberation insurgencies on concentration camps, the genocidal, artificially imposed famine in Ukraine in 1932-33, on psychiatric asylums, the Bolshevik Holocaust, on heroes of the national liberation struggle against Soviet Russia and communist oppressors, on the catacomb church, on the believers in God, martyrs, on the heroic prisoners such as Yuri Shukhevich should be prepared for general public distribution in the free world. 
the free world should allocate sufficient financial and economic resources to the liberation struggle to enable the national liberation, anti-communist, anti-Soviet Russian movements, respective insurgencies to win since supporting insurgencies, it, it, much, it costs much less than fighting a conventional war. The West should cease to supply grain, technology, credit, and arms to the Soviet Union and its satellites. Western trade has only served to sustain the tyrannical Russian Empire. The ABN conference condemned the systematic Russification of all nations subjugated by Russian imperialism, aiming to create a Soviet people, a Russian supernation, and appealed to the free world to refrain from calling and considering the subjugated nations in the USSR as one Soviet people. The ABN conference condemned Soviet Russia for its total denial of religious freedom and the persecution of, of religious leaders such as Yosef Karela and Vasil Kobren. The ABN conference condemned the slow murders of Ukrainian cultural leaders such as Oleg Satehi, Valery Marchenko, Yuri Litvin, Oleksiy Nikitin, Vasil Stus, as well as the mass executions of members of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, and the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA. The ABN conference demanding the application of the 25-year-old UN resolution on decolonization to the last existing empire. The communist Russian empire unwavering stands for the dissolution of this empire and the subsequent reestablishment thereof of national, independent, democratic states within their ethnographic territories. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarusia, Ukraine, North Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Turkestan, Ido Ural, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Serbia, Slo Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, Nicaragua, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and many other people. Their centers and spokesmen should be accepted into the framework of the UN as the true representatives of the nation subjugated by Bolshevism. <laughs> the ABN demands, just as it did before the Belgrade Conference, to officially proclaim the Helsinki Accord null and void, since these accords affirm the status quo of Russia communist expansionist occupation, and thus render a, a priori the issue of human rights of the subjugated nations unattainable. The defenders of national and human rights in the Soviet Union, who were hitherto clandestine fighters, were themselves vulnerable to persecution by publicly appealing to the Helsinki Accord without any help or protection from the free world. The ABN conference demands that the International Red Cross Convention regarding the legal and equal treatment of insurgent armies be respected in the struggle against the Bolshevik invaders. The ABN conference appeals to the nations of the third world, many of which liberated themselves during the last decade to support the freedom, justice, national independence, and human rights against the evils of tyranny, despotism, neo-colonialism, and totalitar totalitarianism of the Russian imperialists and communists together with the proxies. The nations of the free world must work towards the liquidation of slave labor concentration camps and psychiatric prisons, the cessation of genocide, such as the famine siege of Ukraine, and the liberation of political and religious prisoners. The means to achieve this is through economic boycotts of the USSR, its exclusion from international organization, and the development of powerful psychological warfare. The ABN conference appeals to the US government, the US Congress, and to all free nations to establish a center for psychological warfare within NATO or the Pentagon, which would include spokesmen for the national liberation organizations of the subjugated nations. We ask that a Freedom Academy be created specializing in the analytical study of the problems of the subjugated nations, working out a psycho strategy and the training of cadres as a counterpart to the Lumumba University in Moscow. The ABN conference supports the US Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI program, which aims to liquidate weapons of mass annihilation and to establish a defense for human beings against Bolshevik aggression. The conference emphasizes, however, 
that the Russian Empire cannot be dissolved and victory for the free world against communism cannot be attained without the use of offensive forces. The, off the offensive weapons which can, be ach which can achieve this is the liberation struggle of the subjugated nations. Without a low frontier strategy, a high frontier defense is but a variant of the anachronistic balance of power system in an epoch experiencing a global rise of national liberation struggles. The synthesis of the high and the low frontier strategy, SDI, in the liberation struggle of the subjugated nation, if supported by the free world, would solve the, cur the current global political crisis caused by Russian aggression. Memories can be. Uh, I have an additional wording, and I'd like to put it to you. The EFC ABN London Conference condemns without reservation the Soviet siege of the American Embassy in Afghanistan and considers that it was a brazen attempt to bring unbearable pressure upon the United States in the build-up to the Geneva summit. This conference demands that the United States and the West never weaken under such threats Soviet threats and Soviet intimidation. This is for, I believe you meant Pakistan, sir, is that correct? The Soviet siege where? In Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. Mrs. Potter, do you agree to accept that? Yes. And the others member. Uh, we will adjourn and uh, just uh, we will have dinner. We are all invited. Uh, please. Uh, before, before you leave, uh, I would like to say that Mr. Globovsky from League uh, gave us two statues of late Patriarch Slipey, Cardinal Slipey, Ukraine Patriarch, and they will be presented tomorrow, but he is leaving today, so we are thankful to him for this, uh, his uh, gracious gifts, and now we adjourn.